Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Arwain aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lintamande. Thread 1, Mad Investor Chaos and the Woman of Asmodeus. Episode 17. I'll start with a probing sort of question, though if everyone's too tired I can step back from probing questions. On the other hand, if only some of you are too tired, that part can continue. I'll see if I get sensible answers, I guess. Anyhow, Optimizing your whole population gene pool is obviously not something you'd want to make mistakes with. How could you gain more knowledge about what you were doing in advance of doing anything risky? Do it with part of your population? One duchy, not the whole country? Better than doing it with the whole country, possibly. But heritage optimization takes time. Every time you try something and see what happens, you have to wait one human generation to see what happens. And if you need two generations, well... That adds up very quickly. Gonna keep the whole country waiting while you play around in that one duchy? Doing nothing also has risks. Speed of discovery matters. It's not enough to get there eventually. How can you figure out what the ass you're doing with heritage optimization without spending 20 years every time you want to try something? How can you learn about the sort of mistakes that only show up three generations later in less than 60 years? Do it with mice? Do it in a time-dilated demiplane? Ask Asmodeus? Yeah, you got some resources we don't got in Dathilan. I assume that time-dilated demiplanes are very expensive, but I nonetheless can't help but ask how much we have to prove ourselves before we get to tuck ourselves into one of those and do the rest of this faster. The nearest known permanent one is in Nex, on another continent, and I don't think it's listed for rent, though maybe they have a price. It wouldn't be very surprising if we had a secret one for emergencies, but it's probably tiny. If so, they're cheaper if they're tiny. And the queen has a necklace of adaptation, so she wouldn't need it to have air, if there's one just for her and Lirilatha. Well, not step one, then. But you really might end up with some very nice things in a very short time, if you can scale the technology and magic to where you can get a decent-sized research team into a time-dilated demiplane. But I digress. In Dathilan, sure, you could use mice. But why limit your ambitions to just playing around with mice? Humans aren't the only sort of biological organisms with useful heritages. This puzzles them. Orcs have a faster generation time than humans and are more like us than mice, someone offers. Good case for starting with an orc duchy if there's one around here. But remember that I've been telling you the secrets of life itself, in general. Do you use life for anything around here? Corn, says Tanya. It grows every year, and we do select it a lot for not getting weevils and having big ears. Yep. Corn's got two packages per package. Tuple the same as humans, if I recall. Though not 23 package tuples. I don't recall the exact number. Wheat. If you've got that here, which I expect you do, because the word translated, if it's the same wheat I know at least, has six packages per package tuple. If you've been selecting plants at all, and the people who've been selecting them have already made any effort to try things systematically and observe results, there's a whole body of knowledge there that you might be able to apply to heritage optimization in general. And if they haven't been trying things systematically and observing results, then that's the art you're here to learn. And whatever wonderful theories and strategies you come up with, why maybe you could try them faster and cheaper on a field of corn than on a duchy. They're systematic, Tanya says. Probably not the way people are in Dathilan, but they know what kinds do well with what weather, and how they all hybridize, and they track yield per acre, and they trade tips, and particularly good strains. Eh, that's an example of the good news-bad news duality right there. It's no doubt been good for Cheliacs that they already know that much, but bad news that they'll have already tried a lot of obvious stuff, which makes it harder for us to stroll in and double corn yields on our first try. Are there specialists who make particularly good strains, or do people just trade them as they randomly crop up? I don't think there's a way to make them besides planting historically good strains and seeing how they do. Not that I heard of, anyway. Well, if they're already doing the obvious, I think the steps beyond that are knowledge for sale, not universal basics. Still, should probably get a book on that. But if we got that book, and after reading it... The notion of the tiny spirals and the package tuples gave you some idea that you thought people probably hadn't tried yet. Well, 
What sort of precautions should you take when trying to create new strains of corn using a clever new method nobody's tried before? Because in real life, on really novel problems, there's no teacher telling you which precautions you need to take or correcting you if you miss one. Pray for guidance? I know that's not what you're going for, but it's actually the frontline intervention for unexpected consequences, really. Maybe Asmodeus is sick of saving us from mistakes we could catch ourselves. Starting small, like with one duchy except maybe even smaller, one cornfield. Checking the corn for poison to make sure you didn't make it worse somehow. Feed the corn to mice before you fed it to humans, sure. But then, besides asking what precaution should I take, one should perhaps first ask, what exactly could go wrong in the first place? What could potentially go wrong with trying to create a new strain of corn? How could there be a disaster, not just a minor stumble, from trying to create a new strain of corn? Otolman's wishes she had not been reminded of that. Those were not good times. This is a question Chelish wizards are spectacularly good at answering. It happens to be really good for a certain kind of pest, and they grow to ten times their usual size and eat everyone in the village. It smells irresistible to dragons. It angers the fae. It's so much more fertile than all other corn that it gets carried away on the wind and grows everywhere, blotting out all other life, until nothing grows anywhere on the continent but corn. It's great for a couple years, but it's sucking all the vitality out of the soil and leaves only sand behind. It lures man-eating rats from the underdark, and then the infestation is impossible to root out. It grows 600 feet in height and angers the aerial dragons. Locusts that lay their eggs in it have an unnaturally high survival rate. And so instead of occasional clouds of locusts, we have constant clouds of locusts, and they blot out the sun. It's addictive, and once you've eaten it, you can't eat anything else. It disrupts the flow of magical energies through the land beneath its roots and remaps all the ley lines in Cheliacs, which causes a bunch of adjustment hurricanes and strands half the towns on the royal line. It develops impossible geometry, the kind where looking at it gives you a headache, and anyone who wanders into the field come harvest time is lost forever. It requires so much water that it sucks up water for hundreds of miles around, turning half of central Cheliacs to desert. It's actually just mediocre corn, but with mind control to make you think it's really great corn. And we're convinced we succeeded and planted everywhere, at which point it's powerful enough to enslave the whole country. The little mortals really have no idea, do they? Does that sort of thing happen a lot around here? I, I mean, those would be unusually bad outcomes. Usually interactions between the natural world and surrounding magical geography are fairly bounded, there's only a couple documented incidents of ley lines moving because of ecological changes alone. Something going horribly wrong with pests is pretty likely, but that's what adventurers make a living handling. Plants are the category of living thing, least likely to spontaneously develop spell-like abilities or sapience. There are only about a hundred known kinds that have. No one has the slightest idea what angers the fae. Planting a new corn crop might but not planting a new corn crop might too. And if the dragons are mad, they'll probably tell us. Burn some villages first, but then tell us. And... I am suddenly concerned about whether I have accidentally fallen into the trap of thinking I am a story protagonist instead of applying the principle of mediocrity. When I landed near the world wound, was I otherwise improbably being placed near the most important present disaster in the world, or actually is, most of Galarian like that outside the protected housing, and the world wound was just number twelve on the list of worst disasters from the previous week? Keltham's first order uncorrected, intuitive probability. He'll want to have kids here has now fallen to sixty-five percent. Not so much from this update about Galarian's nature, per se, as what it implies about a predictable string of first order updates that have all been in the same direction so far. I think the world wound is a reasonable candidate for the worst problem in the world, Meritzel says. There are a few other planar rifts, but they're much smaller. Cheliax has most of our military deployed at the world wound. We wouldn't do that if there were ten things as likely as it to destroy the world. But there are a lot of places that are horrible on a scale that won't destroy the world. Well, 
At least that's a slightly pleasant surprise about how nice a place Galarian is to live, compared to where I just sent my second-order estimate. Keltham genuinely is relieved about this. To be repeatedly surprised by the same observation indicates that the machinery making up yourself is not properly reflecting the idea of surprise. A stable meta-rule. No matter how bad you imagine Galarian is, it is actually worse. Implies some defect in you, and not just the planet. A lot of people, it has occurred to Carissa, think Cheliax is the worst problem in the entire world. That's because they're dumb and get really worked up about a little bit of torture, though. So if this was Dathelan, I'd know how probable or in a sense typical the disasters you named actually were, but I have very little sense of that here. Being able to imagine disasters at all is step one. Being able to refine your sense of which disasters are actually likely to hit you is step two. Then, usually, after that, you need a step three where people realize that even if they don't like a disaster and start hurling insults at it about it being super incredibly improbable, there's a difference between the kind of disaster that ignores insults like that and gets you anyways versus the kind of disaster that really actually goes against the character of reality and almost certainly won't happen. I cannot guide you through developing that sense for probabilities using realistic examples, because, I am realizing, I have an abut's notion of where any of what you said falls on that spectrum. But if you have a sense of something like, what is a typical disaster for Galarian that might happen to you personally while breeding a new crop? versus things that happen often enough that you hear about them, but rarely enough that they haven't happened to you or anyone you know. Versus possibilities that can't really get at you. From a selfish perspective, people are mainly incentivized to guard against common disasters that hurt themselves. If you look at it from the perspective of Chelish governance, it's their job to make sure anyone who's allowed to experiment inside their country needs to be guarding against country-injuring rare disasters and both of these agents will be falling down on their jobs if they spend all their resources guarding against imagination, capturing disasters that are genuinely out of character for reality, and not just being insulted by being called names like impossible. So, common-level disasters, rare-level disasters. Ruins the soil is common, Tanya says. Attracts new pests that grow to unusual size is common, grows too well, and takes over your other fields, too, is common. All of those have happened to my father or my grandfather. Angers, the fay is. Happens to someone's cousin in another village. The usual rule is that as you go up the tech ladder, the danger levels go up because the power levels go up, meaning that smaller missteps can have larger effects. I do not get the impression that this is the tiniest bit untrue of magic and galarian. But, just to check... Seems right... The world wound was caused by a fight among gods. Most other really bad things I can think of were caused by epic wizards. As you get more clever at breeding plants, you can, to some degree, even in Dath Ilan without magic, manage to do a bit more damage than if you were less clever. If you successfully use focused breeding to create corn that is incredibly resistant to the most common diseases around, more disease-resistant than any corn has ever been before, it may be more likely than regular corn to take over all your other fields by accident. If you breed ultra-fast-growing plants and plant them repeatedly on the same land, year after year, they will suck key nutrients out of the soil, unless you figure out what those nutrients are and take extra steps to replenish them. Even if you figure out how to provide the plants with the nutrients that they need to keep growing, the fast-grown plants may end up less nutritious for people or animals who eat those plants unless you replenish aspects of the soil that aren't as obvious. Subtle deficiencies that people may not notice at first, especially if people are eating the older crops, too, for a while. If you figure out how to fix the short-term problem of your fast-growing crops dying, by replenishing the aspects of soil that just the plants need, you may not replenish enough of key tiny nutrients that people need. Praying for guidance sure would be helpful for that sort of thing, if it worked perfectly reliably. But even leaving aside the point that apparently prophecy is broken now, it seems wiser for you to try to develop the skill that we needed in godless Dathilan. Like, at least write down in advance what you predict the guidance will be before you pray for guidance. You rotate crops, says Tanya, and maybe take soil samples to see how other older crops grow in them? Rotating crops help some. 
doesn't fix the whole problem, because there's some things that almost every crop takes from the soil. How much is it helping? Feed your rotated fast-grown crops, and non-rotated fast-grown crops, and slowly grown crops to mice, or other animals that grow in even faster generations, and see how the three groups do health-wise relative to each other. Keep your eyes open. Don't wait for problems to materialize before you start looking. Imagine things that might go wrong and look for them early. Maybe you'll catch something you didn't imagine while you're looking for some possible problem. You did imagine. The important thing is to keep your eyes open wider. Besides soil depletion, if you figure out how to grow more crops faster, there's one other problem that's very predictable. That happens because of how well you succeeded at plant breeding, and it leads into another one of those larger points. Suppose you produce a single field of corn, all of one strain. That's the best corn you've ever seen. It grows fast. It's resistant to disease and insects and strong winds. It's tastier than the previous corn. You feed it to mice, and the mice do fine. You find, well, you probably don't have replicators. You find somebody reliable to verify your reports, and you take that corn strain and sell it to farmers all over Cheliacs. A year later, it's the most profitable corn anyone has ever seen, and only a complete fool of a farmer would grow anything else the next year. Two years later, it's the only strain of corn that anyone still grows in Cheliacs, and it's starting to displace other crops that are less profitable to grow. All massively replicated out of that one original field. What happens next? If there's a blight, it'll take out half our food crop, says Tanya, because everything will have the exact same vulnerability. Not if. There will be a blight. It's not just that there's a corn blight and Cheliacs is growing too much corn. It's that blight itself is a form of life, and it reproduces and blight that targets this exact strain of corn will reproduce faster on this exact strain of corn, and then reproduce just as fast when it jumps to the next ear of corn that all came through the same bottleneck and all has the same genetic information inside it. Everything still alive has an internal system that counterattacks and resists disease, and since everything has slightly different tiny spirals, all the internal systems use slightly different counterattacks and methods of resistance. If all the ears of corn are too similar to each other, if you copied too much of the tiny spirals too fast and made too many organisms out of them, because they were such great tiny spirals and such great organisms, the disease that's mutating and reproducing and targeting those exact disease-fighting systems will get too good at targeting those exact disease-fighting methods and wipe them all out. The same thing would happen if we produced a kid with INT20 and there was magic for copying kids, and somebody got the bright idea that Cheliacs needed a million kids like that. There's a million tiny variants of even minor diseases. One of those variants would happen to be really strong against that exact form for a disease-fighting system. And then, instead of the disease just killing that one kid, he'd sneeze, and that variant would jump to the copy of the kid. And then the next copy, and the next and that variant would be just as effective against all of them. That's one reason why Dathi Lan doesn't take the thousand brightest men in the whole world and try to have them each get ten thousand women pregnant. It's copying too much of the heritage information too fast. Also sounds logistically difficult, someone mutters. Hey, if doing that sort of thing wouldn't kill everyone, jumping two intelligence points in a generation would be worth a few logistical difficulties. His audience which is definitely interpreting a few logistical difficulties as you'd have to have the men under an exceptionally powerful dominate person with a team of dedicated clerics healing them and keeping them under, nods seriously. Keltham, who is definitely interpreting a few logistical difficulties as some mix of men mastering the partial ejaculation technique if they're doing it the fun way and otherwise divide up the sperm quickly so it's still healthy during the mass insemination processes, continues. One reason I'm giving you this caution, obviously, is so that if you do start getting results from more directed and clever heritage optimization, you don't push your luck. The disease counterattack is close to a universal hazard if you start deriving too many children from too few parents. The larger point is that variation itself is a kind of resource. It doesn't just apply to variation of disease-fighting systems, although that sure is one of the clearest cases of it. If you're tackling a difficult mental problem, and you've got five people on your team, 
Adding a sixth person who thinks in a different way from the first five people is often a larger boost than adding somebody's previous acquaintance from a previous job who had a lot of similar life experience. There are also benefits to people knowing each other, to be clear, but the longer you've hammered on a problem without solving it, the more likely it is that you need somebody new. The variation of your crops is a kind of resource that plant species has, making it more likely that at least some of it survives when it gets challenged with a new kind of weather, a new kind of pest. When you apply powerful breeding pressures to a crop and squeeze it through narrow bottlenecks of parentage, you lessen that variation as a side effect and make the crop probably less resilient in some dimensions, even if you're improving it in others. Variation is a kind of resource for heritage optimization, and the process of heritage optimization uses some of it up. This ties into something that, in Dathalan, is seen as a central dichotomy of all life's existence, a dichotomy between he needs to be careful in speaking here, so that the direct spell-supplied translation from the Dathalani terms into Taldane doesn't give away his point too early. Diversity and optimality. After all, if there's a best way to do things, wouldn't doing it any different way necessarily be doing it worse? Think about the logic I showed you earlier today, the one which can derive exactly all of the actual consequences of the premises and no non-consequences of the premises. If you had a logic that was meaningfully different from that one, wouldn't it have to be, in some sense, worse? I pose to you this question, then, which I have not yet told you how to answer. Is diversity only ever valuable in places where we haven't found the best strategy? Is there necessarily some optimal disease-fighting system an organism could have, which could fight off every different form of disease that exists? And if an organism had that, it could be duplicated a million times without worry. It's like war. There's not a single best military strategy that defeats all other military strategies. There are things that work out best for a range of possible things your opponents might be doing, and you can't be engaged in the best possible tactic against anything they might be doing. There are trade-offs. Best disease-fighting system sounds less ridiculous than best war-fighting system, but I think only because we know how to fight wars, so the trade-offs are obvious. Well, perhaps, perhaps. But let's consider some much simpler case than complicated oppositional games. Do you have locks here, which go by knowledge? Say, somebody has to punch in a series of numbers, or spell out a sequence of words to open the lock? No. Wizards use magic for locks. Everyone else, I think, uses mechanical ones, with keys. There's a Dath Elani proverb to the effect that a key and a code is more effective than just a key or a code, because keys can be stolen as codes can be spied on. But maybe that doesn't apply if there's a first circle spell that makes keys only work in the hands of authorized holders? Mostly, I don't know how you'd do a lock with a code. I've never heard of that. Buttons labeled 0 through 9. You've got to enter six numbers in the correct order to open the lock. I would not have thought that would take a very complicated mechanism. It seems very simple compared to other mechanisms. Heck, with 16 buttons, just needing to depress the correct 8 buttons in any order while leaving the 8 other buttons raised would provide significant protection. That seems very easy to visualize as a lock, though making it not be externally obvious when you have some of the buttons correct but not others would take more work. Well, anyways... In Dathilan, there are locks which require a key, or numbers, or both, depending on how strong you want to make them, and whether you're more worried about stolen keys or spied-on codes. And security issues, like making sure that somebody can't tell which numbers are being depressed by listening to the sound of the clicks, or not having the interior mechanism of the key be examinable from the outside of the key before it's inserted into the lock, stuff like that. Is there such a thing as there being one best code or one best key that you could use to fend off the greatest possible number of thieves, and then no better code or better key than that could exist? No, the class choruses. Isn't that, in some sense, contradictory to the very notion of intelligence? If you can measure intelligence with numbers and keep going past 20, past 30, past 100... Shouldn't there come a point where the greatest possible and most perfect intelligence can determine the one best possible code for a lock? I guess eventually you could come up with a number so long and hard to specify that no one less smart than you is capable of generating it, and that'd be the best possible code for a lock. 
Well, it's good that you don't just say no and give up on the question. In Dath Ilan, once you get past the kind of locks that parents use to keep young children from wandering into the workshop, or the, no word for that then, where do they do it? Cuddle room, you get what's called keeper locks, though they also appear on the more powerful weapons the military is allowed to own. One component of a keeper lock is a kind of key that's physically impossible to duplicate, though it has to be refreshed each time it's used. The other component is a game that never plays out the same way twice, with rules of a form that our brains can learn subconsciously, without ever figuring them out consciously. The knowledge that gets you inside consists of you having learned to play the lock's game, after a few days or hours of practice, and occasional refreshers. And you don't consciously know what the game's rules are, so you literally can't explain to anybody else how to get inside, even if they drug you. But let's say the lock just has ten digits and six numbers. Can an entity with intelligence 100 determine the best possible six-number sequence that every such lock should use? No, they chorus again. Well, why not exactly? The only thing that makes a code good is that no one knows it. So use your intelligence 100 to pick out the best possible code that people are least likely to guess. Well, if it's in every lock, then they'll just put a bunch of, uh, employees to work trying it on one lock, and once they get it, they'll know all the locks. Uh, well, perhaps. Let's look at it from the other side. If there's a ten-digit six-number lock I need to get through, can I use my 100 intelligence to discover the single best sequence to try on a lock like that? Yeah, you could mind-read the creator and figure out what rule they use to set it. Let us suppose that mind-reading is not possible. Clever guessing is. You cannot determine a single correct code with certainty, just that some codes are more likely than others. I put to you, then, that the code which is most likely to open the lock is the best code to try entering into it. The students agree with this, but suspiciously. Well, for concrete example, if a silly factory makes all its locks with a default code of 012345, and occasionally some silly people forget to change the default code, then 012345 might be the best code to try entering. It may only open one in 10,000 locks, because very few people are that silly, but it will still open more locks than any other code. Or if there's a number that's lucky in some religion, so people change their locks to that. Wait, so they actively change their lock to one that's... Can you tell me whether or not you're joking about that being a thing people would really do? I haven't actually met anyone with Intelligence 10 in my life before, and I don't know what that's like. Yeah, people do that. I mean, we don't have that kind of lock, but people do that sort of thing. They have magic item passwords that are famous magic item passwords, or the names of their kids. All right, duly noted. You people seriously need to raise your average intelligence level before somebody accidentally blows up what's left of the planet. To resume where we left off. Having thus determined that 012345 is the best, the most optimal code you can possibly try on a lock, I put to you that clearly the optimal strategy for opening a coded lock is to repeatedly try 012345 on it until it opens. Agreed? Suspicious chorus. No. Why not? Seems reasonable to me. If you have the optimal best method, you should keep using it. I guess if the lock has a persistent tendency to change its own password to 012345 because it has fond memories of the workshop it was created in, Meritzel says. Careful with that kind of cleverness. There's another famous dichotomy between being smart enough to think of correct answers versus smart enough that you can take any answer and come up with a weird way for it to be correct. In real life, entering 012345 repeatedly into the lock is stupid even though it's possible to imagine an exotic circumstance where it isn't. I'm not saying you should never think the way you just did. I'm saying that you should always clearly label it inside and outside, as having come up with a clever, weird circumstance under which it would make sense to do something that is in real life stupid. Anyways, I'm glad you all now agree with me that the best way of getting through number sequence locks is to repeatedly enter in 012345 on them. You just said that was stupid. That was some other Keltham. I'm the Keltham who thinks that repeating 012345 is a great strategy, and he's going to keep lecturing you on that until one of you manages to talk him out of it by explaining exactly what he's doing wrong. They giggle nervously. If it didn't work the first time, then it'll only work this time if the lock magically changed, and changed to this specific code. 
and you haven't got any reason to think it did that, so you might as well just set a construct to trying all possible combinations, in order at this point, before you try any twice. Wait, so you're saying that 012345 isn't the best code to try? What's the better one, then? Any of them which you haven't tried yet. I'm confused. If on the first turn, 012345 is the best combination to try, and the lock hasn't changed, it should still be the best combination to try on the second turn. No, because if it were right, it would have opened the lock, so now you know it's wrong. So what you're saying is that my knowledge about the lock changed, but not the lock itself. I suppose I could buy that. Doesn't that mean I'd have to keep on changing which things I tried as I observed the results, and my knowledge kept changing, though? That sounds inconvenient and difficult, and not very lawful, really. They're so confused. I mean, you probably want to build a construct, Pela, who has been arguing for this solution for a while, says more firmly, which just tries every number in order, and you expect that it's one of the remaining numbers until you've tried them all. Wouldn't it be better to build a lawful construct instead of a chaotic one, which repeatedly use the optimal number instead of, like, all these other non-optimal numbers? I'm definitely going to do that if you don't talk me out of it somehow. Going to be a great construct. The best. Optimal. Trying every number in order is plenty lawful. Law has nothing to do with doing the exact same thing over and over. Carissa, who is going to be able to resolve the bet this evening, proposes everyone double or nothing on their is Keltham a sadist betting. If it's the best thing, you should do it over and over. If it's not the best thing, you should do the best thing instead. If that isn't lawful, then what is law exactly? It stops being the best thing once you've tried it. Law is, if you're doing a dumb thing and you think it's lawful, you're probably just confused about what law is. It doesn't mean you have to do dumb things. Well, perhaps I am confused about the law because I thought it said to do a dumb thing. But then what is the law actually? Can it be explained to me, or do I just have to enter whichever exact codes you tell me to? I don't think approaches to guessing a password can be lawful or chaotic. And we've been telling you the thing you should do, which is try all the numbers in order. All right. Speaking more seriously now. It's easy to tangle yourself up with paradoxes of what is best, what is optimal, especially when you define the word even slightly different ways, see it from slightly different angles across two times you use the word. There's a mistake that young Dathilani make, skewing male rather than female, though also some girls and not all boys, of course, where they can't quite accept the fact that older children know more than they do and have higher measured cognitive powers and some of them get fascinated with the ways that you can tangle up your reasoning and prove that you're actually better than the older children because you're more ignorant than they are, or smarter than the optimal way of doing something. It's one of the things where, when a boy makes a mistake like that, the older children and the watchers don't try to talk him out of it and let him go on believing it for a few years so he can have his enjoyment and also learn a valuable life lesson when he's old enough to more carefully disentangle all of the paradoxes. This valuable lesson is that paradoxical-sounding questions have non-paradoxical answers if you define everything precisely enough and don't mix up your words. Even if you cannot see the answer yet, you should expect that such an answer exists. Confusion exists in our minds, not in consistent mathematics. In this case, I could formalize the solution by saying, for example, that there is such a thing as a best sequence of codes to try, given your state of knowledge about the lock, and that repeatedly trying the most likely first code forever is among the worst possible sequences. Or I could say that since our knowledge changes with each observation, the best second code to try, given the results of observing the first code, is not equal to the best first code to try. This, I realize, may not sound particularly better than any of the other arguments you were using against silly Keltham, but they fit into larger frameworks I can talk about later. A Dathilani would tell you that you're mistaken in thinking that there's no lawful approach to guessing a code. You can use math to describe your beliefs about which codes have which probabilities of working. Describe mathematically how those probabilities change with each observation as successive codes are ruled out, and that math then describes the next best guess. That doesn't mean you can do better by thinking explicitly in math, of course, instead of just quickly typing in possible passwords that seem likely. But the math does exist. On a larger scale... The point I want to make again 
is about that dichotomy between optimality and diversity. The reason why you don't want to take a single stalk of corn and plant exact copies of it all over the country. When we talked about the case of the lock and its codes, we got two different angles on a way to resolve the children's paradox of it apparently not being best to just use the best answer. The first angle is that of the adaptive adversary, the corn blight, the master criminal considering the lock. The more regular we make our own answer, the more the adversary's adaptivity or intelligence is able to analyze and defeat it. We use randomization as a way to make it harder for their own intelligence to grasp. There's nothing paradoxical about the idea that the more random something is, the less knowable it is, the more it may inconvenience some other mind. It's the kind of variation that's valuable in the disease-fighting systems inside human and corn, the kind that makes it harder for diseases to learn our defenses. But the other viewpoint on the lock and code is the more important one. It's the reason why, if your team has been having trouble solving a problem for a while, you might want to add a new person who thinks less like the rest of you. It's a resource that a field of cornstalks has for adapting to a sudden shift in the environment, a new weather extreme. If the crop is more diverse, maybe some hardier stalks will survive to be replanted next year and then do better against that environment. It's the kind of variation where you're trying things in many places, and because of that, trying overly similar things in many places is something that yields less expected profit to you. There are dimensions of society in which you want everyone behaving differently, so they can explore a space instead of all crowding together into one corner of it. There are dimensions of society where things go pretty well, so long as you do something the correct way, and start to go poorly if you do things much differently than that. There is a tension in Dathilan between positions, between people and factions, between ideas and arguments, about that question. Not just about particular cases, but about the sense in general of where all society should move on that spectrum. Whether it is more important in general for everyone to do things a bit more differently in our future, or if the problem is more that we're falling too far below some standards and we all need to improve in those ways together. There are lots of particular cases in Dathilan where people might hold different opinions, and not just one general opinion. But there is a sense that this general dimension of existence is one where the exact balance is important to a society. Dathilan has terminology for this dichotomy of strategies, between the search to find the optimal best answer, and use it, versus trying many different answers to be more resilient against unknowns and explore a space more widely. Though I've been deliberately substituting the words optimal and diverse in this language instead of the two Taldane words that the translation spell tries to automatically output. If I say the Dath Ilani words directly, for these two directions, a society can move along this dimension. They come out in this language as lawful and chaotic. Elias Abarco is not an 18-year-old girl and is not going to gape wonderingly at Keltham because everything makes sense. No one would notice since he's invisible, but he nonetheless has too much dignity. Some things make sense, and some things are even more confusing because why not say that humans can understand that? Reality is so very large and pretty and connected when you catch a sight of it. She wants to see more. Nice, Ione thinks, all the way up where her conscious mind can hear it. I was on the side of chaos, of course. Lawfulness seemed so very boring. I was quite sure we had enough of it already. There's a saying in Dathi Lan that always sounded to me before like sententious pro-law propaganda, whose depth of meaning, I think, I never really appreciated until I came to Golarion. It's the saying that even chaos is almost entirely made of law. Some variation in the cornstalks is useful for resisting disease, or having any survivors, if an especially hot summer comes. If you scramble all the tiny spirals entirely, and insert completely new information, what you get is not much higher levels of useful chaos, you get a plant that entirely fails to form. The wildest, most diverse crop that still manages to live at all must be almost entirely regular, and using almost completely standard forms of everything for its species. Otherwise it comes out, not weird and warped, but simply a dead seed that fails to germinate at all. When you're adding a new and different mind to your team, full of wild ideas, they should hopefully be speaking mostly grammatical sentences that make sense, and not uttering random words and random sounds and twitching around wildly on the floor. The full absence of law is not diversity, 
but randomness, noise. In many cases, nearly all the random ways of doing things get you pretty much the same effect. There is not much difference in contribution between a person wildly twitching on the floor in one way versus a different way. They look much the same from outside. Even diversity has to be almost entirely made out of shared order, and climb high up on the scale of optimality away from the level of noise in order to be effectively diverse. Even chaos is made almost entirely out of law. I thought it was something of a sententious old proverb that was emphasizing one particular viewpoint on an underlying truth that seemed overly trivial. I wanted to think thoughts that nobody had ever thought before. Sure, well, of course, I didn't want to do that. By thinking random words, obviously, I wanted to start companies or invest in companies that nobody else would have thought of, that no other investor would invest in. I wanted to show that the way I thought differently was better and worthy of further exploration. Of course, if I wanted to pull that off successfully, it would be a matter of art and skill, governed by laws, with relevant history to study and relevant investigations to do. I thought that sort of thing didn't belong to law alone. Chaotic people like me could say it too, so there wasn't anything especially lawful about it. Even chaos is made almost entirely out of law, in a fashion governed by higher orders. Mathematics, whose name in baseline also tends to translate into Taldane as law. I have gotten to this place, Galarian. I have heard what many of your countries are doing. It is pretty clear that even the factions called lawful seem to be confused about many things. And I am resigned at this point to the fact that at some point I am also going to have to go and somehow straighten out all the chaotic parts, because it seems pretty likely at this point that all y'all are also doing that part all wrong. In conclusion, the value of diversity in your heritage and its nature as a kind of resource that strong optimization uses up, especially variation that has the nature of useful variations rather than destructively random variations, is another reason why, if you meet a human visitor from another plane with 18 intelligence, it's a great time to make an exception to any usual social rules about not just subsidizing the very best men to have 144 kids apiece, because the diversity of your heritage will actually go up when you add in some kids from a smart alien, and some of your kids may think a little differently and be more useful to add to projects. This concludes my sales pitch. I have added in many of the caveats that I knew about, but I may have been biased in my thinking about them nonetheless. I have tried to give you the knowledge you'd need to do your own thinking about it independently. Any questions? In your conception of chaos, says Meritzel, what would a chaotic god be like? That is a really excellent question, and I just flatly do not understand where, say, Calistria fits into this picture. One guess is that there are additional things wrapped up in the divine version of chaos, besides the Dathalani words that translate into it, which would make sense of how women being vengeful at men could be especially chaotic. Another guess is that I don't understand your society well enough to understand how Calistria is a move in the direction of wider exploration or less centralized planning. Carissa thinks she has an idea of that, actually but she doesn't want to be that person who wants to talk about sexism every day like she cares what happens to other people. There's another few questions, none all that deep. The class is still a bit theologically startled, and no one's really quite sure what's heresy here. Keltham, who's already worrying that he stretched the endurance of his students, and he can't see this because of cheerful Cheliac's dignity, restrains himself from any overly deep answers. Afterwards, he attempts to dismiss the class for the afternoon. Later on, after he's rested some, he's going to try learning wizard spells with the last of his day. Well, his work day, anyways. If you wish to support the production of this AI-voiced reading of Plane Crash, please visit patreon.com slash askwhocastsai. Any help is appreciated.